Hi, I am Corey Shockey, the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and this is Sound Strategic, our podcast of our sparkly in-house research talent. And I have the pleasure today of having with me Dr. Eleanor Beaver, who works in our Conflict Security and Development Program. She holds a DPhil in Anthropology from the University of Oxford. She has been a journalist. She's worked as a researcher for the Carter Center. She has uh, developed training programs for the EU training mission in Mali, done some interesting and important research in Uganda and the DRC, and she is here to talk with us today. Thank you, Eleanor, for making time away in a very busy season on your work. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me. <laughs> and so as listeners of this podcast know, we have a series of questions that we ask each of our researchers. Um, and the first is, talk to me about what is timely and in the news on the area of your research, Eleanor. So I am a research analyst for conflict security and development, and I cover East Africa mostly. And it's been a very busy time at the turn of the year uh, in this part of the world. Uh, I especially cover DRC and Somalia. And as uh, listeners may well know, the DRC has just had a very contentious election. So that's been, certainly been keeping us busy. Contentious election isn't adequately descriptive. <laughs> Talk to us about what's going on in the election. So uh, very recently, uh, the, the election happened on the 30th of December after several delays and several raised eyebrows over certain procedures in the ele uh, over certain occurrences and certain procedures in the election for example there was a warehouse fire in Kinshasa that destroyed about 8000 of the voting machines due to be used in the capital city for the election uh, which obviously didn't look great for the election's credibility uh, then a bit later down the line, three provinces were more or less excluded from the presidential vote. They were told that they would be allowed to vote in the legislative elections, but would not get to participate in the vote on the 30th of December to elect the new president. And this was because of security concerns and an Ebola outbreak. Um, and then later down the line... The vote happened, uh, and then there was a long wait between uh, the, vote, the voting day itself and the announcement of the results. And the announcement of the results were not what was expected. Uh, given that there had been numerous irregularities, the assumption was that the incumbent president's candidate of choice was going to uh, take the nomination. In fact, uh, to everyone's surprise, one of the two main opposition candidates, uh, named Felix Shisekedi, was named president-elect a few weeks later. Uh, but this was extremely surprising, given that he was certainly not anticipated by uh, the most recent polls or by the um, observations of the, uh, uh, of the main observing bodies. Nobody had expected that he would... Um, that he would be the winner. And so there was a great deal of suspicion around that. And it appears from what we know now uh, that he, uh, she said, he struck a deal with the incumbent president uh, to be named president-elect in the event that uh, the uh, existing government's candidate wasn't able to convincingly uh, win the election. So you're saying that uh, if you had to put it on a scale of a free and fair election, Scale of 1 to 10, where does this fall? Uh, not very high, I'm afraid. Probably, uh, I'm not sure where it stacks up in terms of the size of historical electoral frauds. Uh, but from what we know now, there was a massive data leak last... Uh, um, uh, uh, there was a massive data leak a few days ago uh, in which it became clear that the... Uh, the candidate, Martin Fayulu, who should have won, took 60% of the vote, approximately. 6-0. Zero. 6-0. Zero. And the, uh, the person who was actually named president-elect took around 19 to 20%. So they've really um, reversed, not only reversed the results, but um, given a much more substantial margin to the person they named president-elect than he deserved. So, but a data leak is not the same as a recount. And so what makes you confident that this information now in the public realm that shows that, that 
the candidate that was predicted to win did actually win. That seems like mighty convenient. How does this come into the public realm and why should we believe it? Uh, it comes into the public realm from uh, two sources, actually. So it was the Financial Times that broke the story. They uh, got their data, one set of their data, ironically, came from the voting machines that had caused so much controversy in the first place. Uh, a lot of uh, analysts and observers had assumed that the machines were going to be used to unfairly rig the election. There were also very justified fears around the machines. Um, capabilities around their reliability. Uh, ironically, the results of the machines, though the government had done their best to keep them secret, once those were leaked, they were actually the most transparent record of the vote as it really happened. And the second body of data was, that was leaked uh, was from the Catholic Church's observation mission. Uh, the Catholic Church is a hugely important actor in DRC. It's one of the most influential social and moral voices in that nation and uh, the Congolese look to it as a source of moral leadership very often. Uh, and the Catholic Church's observation data, which was uh, is generally agreed to be reliably recorded, matched up almost exactly with that leaked uh, data so from the machines. So you second source that was validating what the electoral machines themselves had reported. Exactly. That sounds pretty uh, watertight. What happens now? Uh, I, it's either, despite this uh, practically conclusive evidence, as far as we can see it, uh, that the results of the election were um, frankly fraudulent, uh, it seems that the uh, chosen candidate, Shisekedi, is still going to be sworn in uh, in the next few days. The hopes for a recount really hung on international bodies such as the African Union and the Southern African Development Committee. And both of those have uh, changed their positions several times in the pretty tumultuous events uh, over the past few weeks. However, uh, the dust has finally settled and it appears now that both of those bodies have ceded um, ceded control to the Congolese Constitutional Court that has declared the results valid and they're not going to do anything more about it that we know of. So uh, it's highly unlikely that uh, there's going to be any more serious external challenges to the results. Uh, the chief, uh, Martin Fayulu, the candidate who uh, certainly came off best in the uh, leaked results, is now calling for a campaign of civil disobedience. Whether or not that's going to have any traction remains to be seen, uh, but from the outside world's perspective, it seems to be a done deal now. You do a lot of work, you and your team here at the IISS do a lot of work trying to understand what the triggers of conflict are in societies. And, and to try and understand at what point violence occurs in societies. Talk us through how you think about that in the case of the DRC now. In the case of the DRC, uh, the case of the DRC is a, um, all conflicts is complicated, but the DRC uh, pretty much defies wholesale comprehension given how many micro-level factors go into fueling this conflict. Uh, so as uh, some of our listeners may well know, the DRC now has over 100 armed groups operating in the East. Uh, many of these are very small scale, sort of a hybrid between a vigilante group and a proper rebel group. Uh, and then there are certain larger ones that uh, certainly in the past, if not still, have had um, external backers. There is also a long history of collaboration between uh, rebel groups and the National Army. Uh, the National Army has um, is very militarily weak. It was actually itself formed from a sort of amalgamation of rebel groups in the aftermath of the Second Congo War, which ended in 2002, or officially ended. Um, so it's very disunited, and it's sometimes had to outsource its fighting capacity to um, to rebel groups in its own right. And that is a trade-off of sort of short-term security gains, uh, but at the expense of uh, long-term security interests, especially the long-term security of the civilian population, which remains in the eastern provinces still very vulnerable to armed group activity. 
But in terms of the drivers, there's all sorts. There's uh, very short-term interests, especially around uh, natural resources, which in the case of Congo is uh, especially gold and also minerals that are becoming increasingly strategically valuable in global telecommunications, especially cobalt. Uh, so there's huge smuggling networks in which not just armed groups, but the army and the political class are very heavily invested. And uh, the conflict is certainly a facilitating factor for a lot of those networks. Uh, on top of that, there are ethnic factors, although I have always looked at ethnicity as a bit of a red herring sometimes in African conflict. Uh, it usually, there is certainly a legacy of ethnic divisions that was very much exacerbated by um, Belgian colonial rule, which used uh, what they saw as ethnic divisions, often actually very inaccurately, uh, and used those as administrative units. Um, and these days, Ethnic divisions are a way, a prism through which a lot of people um, understand inequality, unfairness, uh, resource distribution, and so on. So that's an yet another driving factor, but there are plenty more. And how did you get interested in this kind of work? What brought you into the field? Oh, it was a long time ago now. I started my, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I started researching a very well-known rebel group as African rebel groups go, which is the Lord's Resistance Army, which was of Ugandan origin. And it was led by this very uh, charismatic figure named Joseph Kony, who was um, a Ugandan um, who believed, uh, supposedly, that he was possessed by a Holy Spirit and was going to lead Uganda according to the Ten Commandments. Uh, and I, my first ever field study was really about a process that I think we would now call religious radicalization, but that wasn't really a word back in, um, back all those years ago when I started studying it. Um, but it, uh, I did some field work examining a sort of coercive indoctrination process of that, uh, that I later saw some very strange parallels in, um, in ISIS in the Islamic State, and they're very much a mimicry of uh, those kind of coercive radicalization tactics. Uh, but that was where I started getting interested in uh, non-state armed groups in general and developed a sort of specialism in East Africa. Uh, and I stayed on working in the region for most of my academic career, including at PhD level, um, though I also started sort of expanding my interests into other regions um, as well. But that's how I got started. It was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your favorite book in your field? The one you wish, if people could only read one book to, to see, to get a basic understanding and excitement about the work you do, what would it be? So the book that um, the book that I very often recommend to people for, I think, a very fresh look at conflict is not one to do with uh, East Africa at all, but it's called An Intimate War, An Oral History of the Hellman Conflict by Mike Martin. Uh, and uh, Dr. Mike Martin is uh, a scholar at King's College, but before that he was a Pashtun language translator with the British Army embedded in Hellman. Huh. And um, it's fair to say that uh, I think all militaries involved in the Afghan conflict had a f um, largely superficial understanding of how the conflict looked at the local level as far as ordinary Afghans caught up in it were concerned. Uh, and what uh, Mike Martin found over uh, several years embedded uh, with his unit in Helmand was that actually the conflict on the ground between what looked to outside eyes like uh, Taliban units was actually extended uh, family conflicts, uh, extended uh, conflicts between very, very localized grievances. Mm. Uh, and so uh, ordinary Afghans was sort of, uh, had actually been involved in all sorts of low level conflicts uh, for a very long time over uh, land distribution, over um, historical tensions and so on. So to, the, uh, to them, the um, foreign forces in Afghanistan looked very different uh, and it had very little to do in their eyes with the organization that, um, with the organization that they knew as the Taliban. Um, so the, I think this book really goes to show the importance of field work in a way when we do uh, conflict analysis and ideally 
in-depth, long-term field work, you start to see uh, insights of how conflict looks uh, from, and it tends to look very different at a very local level um, compared to how it looks in the uh, briefing rooms of foreign policy organizations. Your description of what sounds like a terrific book also reminds me that we, those of us who study war, conflict, warfare, um, and civil strife need to be extraordinarily careful about the what we project into our understanding. That is, we're looking for patterns across very different types of conflicts. And we need to have an enormous dose of humility that we are not imposing a grid that uh, is comfortable to us and doesn't fit the problem. Absolutely. And I think uh, it's fair to say that very often there are patterns and trends in violence. Uh, I think you could certainly talk about certain commonalities in violence across uh, the DRC, across Afghanistan. The problem is that those patterns uh, are often very unhelpful to foreign policy makers. Patterns over, for instance, uh, land conflict, which isn't a subject that many foreign policy makers uh, don't tend to be particularly invested in uh, traditional patterns of Afghan land tenure, for example. It's uh, it's a bit of a niche subject. Nevertheless, uh, through the eyes of local people, this is their existential struggle. This is going to determine whether or not they have enough food to feed their families. This is going to determine um, whether or not they consider somebody else to be their enemy. So these are... Patterns are very often there, and I think we're right to look at those. But yeah, you're absolutely right. We have to be careful that we are not trying to simplify those and um, pretend to ourselves that we can do more about them than we actually can. Let me ask you about the conventional wisdom in your field that you think is wrong. What's a commonly kicked around idea or piece of data that your research shows just shouldn't have the currency that it does? Uh, so I come from an anthropological background uh, and our field or certainly anthropology departments tend to be extremely qualitative and extremely um, open-minded and they tend to be very skeptical of uh, they tend to be very skeptical of quantitative methods. They tend to be often very skeptical of uh, other disciplines that uh, try and find structures and patterns um, across the world. Uh, they are often very cautious about trying to compare uh, one situation with another. Um, there's always a tremendous focus on the local. Uh, whilst I think that's right, uh, I certainly think that it's wrong to suggest that those other more top-down quantitative uh, and uh, pattern or structure focused methods have no value in analyzing something at the local level um, and uh, to address the sort of the matter of quantitative skepticism I remember having a lecturer um, while I was an undergrad uh, at UCL and she was actually a demographer and she was describing being in Mali and embedded with uh, a couple of very, very qualitative anthropologists who were hugely um, snobbish about what she was doing. They were saying you couldn't possibly understand um, the kind of, uh, you know, you can't possibly understand the complexity of life here through a standard demographic survey about reproductive health. Uh, and actually, they then had to slightly eat their words because uh, the she found that um, Malian women were much more comfortable sharing uh, information about their reproductive health, about their um, family size, and so on, in a sort of uh, in a private form uh, that they could fill in in the privacy of their own home than they were talking about it. <laughs> so there is, it's uh, it's not fair to say that. Um, ethnographic fieldwork has all the answers. I don't think it's fair to say that any particular method has all the answers, uh, even though I do stand by the importance of fieldwork and the importance of keeping a pretty forensic eye on local complexities and local detail. Okay. And how about your own work? What's the best, what's the work you've done that you're proudest of, that you would like to define how people think about your professional achievement? 
Oh gosh, I'm, it's a tough one to answer. I think that, um, I think that the interest that has uh, carried through the furthest for me and certainly the one that I hope uh, I can carry on even further in my work at IISS uh, will be uh, this notion that uh, I published a few articles about called coercive radicalization. And this brings me back to uh, discussing the Lord's Resistance Army versus uh, ISIS Islamic State and so on. Um, and this is also what I mean about not being too dismissive of patterns uh, that we see between very different regions. Um, what I wrote about in that uh, in the in that paper was, yeah, a religious indoctrination process done coercively. So very often when we talk about radicalization in the West, we talk about it as if it's a choice. And uh, it's true that in some places, uh, there are a lot more choices open to people who choose to go and join uh, radical militant or terrorist organizations. Um, and of course, that's very different to if you are a Sunni youth in Anbar province in Iraq, or if you are a young Somali uh, living in al-Shabaab territory, your choices there are much more limited. Mm -hmm. Now, with uh, both the Lord's Resistance Army and the Islamic State, uh, so just to bring it back, the Lord's Resistance Army was nominally Christian in that it claimed it wanted to rule Uganda according to the Ten Commandments, uh, though it, it was infused with a lot of uh, traditional Acholi Ugandan religion. Um, both of them had a sort of what I would call a sort of three-step process. And it was usually um, a coercive way of joining the group. So in the uh, in the LRA, it, uh, people were forcibly abducted, whereas uh, with ISIS, there was, um, there was a pattern of conquest. People were very um, violently subjected to very strict rules of living within the group. And they were also consistently told that uh, if you break any of these rules of religious behavior, you will uh, be subjected to tremendous penalties, not just from us, uh, but divine penalty as well. And underpinning both of those groups' logic was a really evident, apocalyptic, uh, millenarian philosophy. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that that tells us a great deal about certain armed groups. Uh, particularly, uh, I think that actually there's a lot more in common between say, the LRA and ISIS than ISIS would have in common uh, with a number of other Islamist groups. Uh, that apocalyptic theology really affected its actions and its strategy. So that's the line of work that um, has raised a lot of eyebrows in conference rooms when I start talking about the apocalypse, but uh, I am nevertheless uh, proud of it. I think it was a really exciting contribution, and it's one that I hope to be able to take forward on the work we have planned on non-state arm groups with the IISS. Outstanding. And my last question, since we are an organization that prides ourselves on being the producers of data, mm -hmm. what is your favorite data visualization? <laughs> Talk us through it. We'll post it alongside the audio of this. OK. Uh, so yes, as I say, I was uh, born into an academic field where uh, data skepticism is uh, fairly common, but uh, there is, and I'm still very much on a learning curve when it comes to using large-scale data sets, uh, but I think there are, there's one particular example that certainly brought home to me the value um, of using large-scale data, and it's by a research unit called Forensic Architecture, which is based out of Goldsmiths University, and they conduct all sorts of uh, open source investigations using data. Uh, and one really interesting visualization they did was of the impact of the 2015 uh, mass forest fires in, um, in, in Indonesia, uh, where lots of uh, rainforested land was cleared, uh, often due to industrial clearance and the palm oil trade and so on. Uh, 21,000 square kilometers of rainforest was destroyed around that year. And then all of a sudden, uh, mass forest fires erupted uh, and the fumes from these fires combined to make this enormous cloud of greenhouse gases that was uh, several hundred kilometers long and a few kilometers thick. Uh, and uh, as 
a step towards um, trying to put the, the concept of ecocide in front of uh, international justice and ecocide being uh, the argument that destroying uh, important environmental resources ought to be treated with similar severity to how we would prosecute war crimes given that it impacts just as many people's lives and livelihoods. So in support of that motion, Forensic Architecture created a data visualization of how this greenhouse gas uh, cloud formed and of how carbon monoxide concentration over, uh, over Indonesia rapidly went up in 2015. And if you click on the visualization, you can see it. You can see this, um, uh, this proportion of carbon monoxide condense over the country and it's very sobering but I think it's a very powerful uh, use of what data can do. What an excellent note to end on. Nella Beaver, thank you so much for you. The, your terrific contributions at the IISS and for talking us through some of your thinking about them today. Thank you very much, it's a pleasure. Mm -hmm.